afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a live talk with Stuart, who is a radio engineer at the Civil Aviation Authority, which is responsible for the regulation of aviation safety in the UK. It's great to see so many schools joining us today, and we'll try and give some of you a shout out in a moment. Um, and to celebrate British Science Week, um, Stuart will explain about careers that are available in the world of aviation and aeronautics today. Please feel free to ask any questions by putting them into the chat, and Stuart will aim to answer as many as he can at the end of his talk. So that's enough from me. I will hand you over to Stuart. Good afternoon, Stuart. Good afternoon and thanks for the introduction and thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, so yes, um, my name is Stuart Rankin. Um, most of my friends and colleagues call me Stu. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk to you um, today a bit about, um, I'll do a tiny bit about kind of my career and how I got to where I am today. And then we'll talk about some of the the, the careers in, in aviation. Um, the first thing I was going to point out to everyone is we tend to use the term aviation, um, which has been used for a number of years by us, particularly the, the CAA, and it's in our name. Um, but a, a truer word is actually um, to use the word aerospace. So when we talk about aviation, we talk about everything that flies within our atmosphere. And some of you might be aware that in recent years, and re particularly recent months with some um, satellite launch attempts from the UK, um, we started to change the language we use and we started to use the term aerospace, which basically encapsulates Everything um, within our own atmosphere, so planes and other things that fly, but also include things that fly into space. Um, so looking into the future, this is as much a talk about careers in the space sector uh, and the aerospace domain as it is about aviation. Um, so just a very brief background on me. Um, so um, a very sh a very short timeline. I was born in 1984, so those of you that are good at maths will know I'm about 38. Um, and when I was a child, I, my parents called me the fiddler, uh, and I was very much into how things worked, um, what made things tick, and taking things apart. And there was one particular incident um, with one of these. This is called a, a video tape player, which your your teachers, some of your teachers might remember. And it's what we used before DVDs, uh, which is what we used before we streamed everything from Netflix. Um, and my parents once caught me trying to feed a digestive biscuit uh, into my videotape player, which I don't suggest anyone tries at home. And I think they realised that I had a particular interest in, in how things worked. Um, so for about my sixth birthday, they bought me one of these. Some of you might have one of these. It's an electronics lab and it's a toy where you can make uh, different electronic circuits and you can make burglar alarms, you can make radios and you can make other things. And I had a particular interest as a child in, in how radio worked and was just fascinated by how music and speech uh, could be beamed into our homes and on the television and how that worked. Um, I moved on to play with computers, um, but I've always had a particular fascination with uh, music uh, and how it's broadcast to us. Um, and I had a particular fascination with with record players and, and how they work. Um, and if you don't know what a record player is, ask your teacher. It's what we used to use uh, before we had CD players, but they are coming back in um, now. So you will see them more and more. But I was just fascinated by how this technology worked and how it produced sound. Um, I went on at school, uh, particularly enjoyed uh, science and maths. And I studied um, for my A-levels at college. I studied electronics, computing, physics and maths. And that led me to study a degree at the University of Brighton in um, electronic engineering and broadcasting. Um, and then I started working in the broadcasting industry. So that's me there uh, with a camera in um, a television studio for who do you want to be a millionaire? Who wants to be a millionaire? Um, so I built television studios. Um, I built a television studio at the top of that building, uh, which is the BT Tower in London. So some of you might know it or perhaps some of you can even see it from your schools. Um, one of the tallest buildings in London and I helped to build a TV studio on the 36th floor um, of that building. Um, after that, I moved to work for the government. Uh, so this is me outside maybe one of the most famous front doors in the country at 10 Downing Street. Um, testing the um, CCTV cameras 
that are installed there. And that's what the little uh, man next to me is for. It's called a Rotakin and it's for testing CCTV. And I had a really good time at the home office. I did some work um, on the Olympic Games um, for security and I did all sorts of other exciting things. I learned to drive a boat um, during that job and I had a really, really good time. And then about uh, seven years ago, I moved to work in aviation uh, and I started working on things like this. This is a radar and some of the technology used um, in a um, control tower. And so my interest uh, specifically in aviation is about all the radio systems that make aircraft work. And if you look at your car, you might see it's got an aerial uh, on the roof of it to pick up the um, radio. Um, so cars have one aerial or maybe a couple. Um, big aircraft like the ones you might go on holiday on have around 30. So they have lots of different systems to make them work. Um, so that's me. Um, so as I say, I work for the Civil Aviation Authority. Uh, and what I'm going to do is play you a quick video that just tells you a bit more about what we do at the CAA uh, and what it means. Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Jason. Our parents work at the Civil Aviation Authority, or CAA for short. They've asked us to come along and tell you all about the CAA and how one day you might have an amazing job working in aviation too. Did you know that the CAA works to keep us all safe and secure whether we are in the air or down on the ground? The CAA is helping aeroplanes, helicopters, gliders, hot air balloons, parachutists and even model aircraft to all use the sky safely and follow important rules and regulations. But that's not all. They also watch over air traffic control, helping pilots to land and take off at airports. And they look after cabin crew who keep people safe while they fly. They make sure new aeroplanes are built properly and are safe too. It's not all about passenger aeroplanes. The CAA looks after the airspace used by military aircraft too. The CAA makes sure pilots are fit and well enough to fly. And they work with lots of other people to make flying as environmentally friendly as possible. Down on the ground, the CAA helps make sure airside operations are organised properly. Airside teams include airport security, who keep us safe before we fly, people who check your tickets, baggage handlers and plane refuelers, not to mention the fire and rescue teams. I love the fire engine! Imagine if you couldn't get home from your holiday or trip, or even go in the first place, because the company you booked your holiday with has problems. A lot of the time, the CAA can help through its atoll protection scheme. My mum says working for the CAA means she is keeping people safe. She is really important. My dad's brilliant too, and he says there are lots of exciting things happening at work. He says perhaps one day soon, we'll all get parcels, or even pizza, delivered by drone to our front door. Mum says even commercial flights into space will be looked after by the CAA. She says if we work hard at our STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering and maths, we could have a brilliant job working in aviation too. Bye! Bye. So there we go. Um, I, hopefully the sound worked for everyone, but if it didn't, don't worry. I think the presentations could be published, but actually that video is on our own website as well. And I'll be talking about a lot of the things that were mentioned in that video. So that, that's what the CAA look after. And I just wanted to share with you some some images of um, the things that we, we look after in the sky. Um, and maybe you can you can think if you've ever seen or been on one of these. So this is probably what we're most famous for is looking after what we call commercial aviation. So typically flights within Europe, uh, maybe to France or Germany or other countries about this size carry about 150 passengers. Um, and obviously there's a number of airlines in the UK and anyone, anyone that's close to Gatwick Airport like I am. Um, you'll see those those airlines come in and out and you know that there's a lot of them um, typically about one 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 a minute um, from Gatwick either taking off 
um, or landing. And then we've got bigger aircraft. Um, this is an A380. So whilst the previous aircraft can carry about 150 passengers, maybe 200 passengers, an A380 is a double-decker uh, aircraft that typically flies for longer distances. So it might fly to places like Singapore um, or Australia, and it can carry up to about 830 passengers. So a really, really big aircraft. Um, and this aircraft is one of my favourite. You might recognise it from behind me. It's called the Airbus Beluga. And it's a modified version of the aircraft we just saw, but it's designed to carry parts of aircraft um, around when they're manufacturing them. Um, and um, they, these do fly across um, to Wales in the UK. So you will see these in the sky if you keep looking. Um, so that's the big stuff that most people are familiar with. But we also do a number of smaller things. We look after uh, small aircraft like this that people might fly as a hobby, um, but they're also used for jobs they do they will do things like take aerial photography or they might be used for the delivery of things or for farming um, and this is a light a light aircraft with a, a relatively small engine will carry up to 10 people um, we also look after gliders and this really is about um, people's hobbies and how they have fun these are aircraft um, without engines uh, and they are effectively catapulted into the sky um, by something called a winch or they're towed by something like the aircraft we just saw and then they glide back down again. Um, and it's a real fascinating hobby, which is really about how you build aircraft that can be really, really efficient and travel a long way even without an engine. And then some of the more modern stuff we do uh, is things like this. Uh, this is a drone. Um, some of you may have one of these. But more and more, we're seeing drones are being used uh, to do certain jobs. And I'll talk a bit about those in a while. Um, and then there's a few other bits. So we look after hot air balloons, um, which typically are used for, for pleasure flights, um, people that are on holiday, people who want to go out and sightsee. Um, but my favourite thing about hot air balloons is that they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And you can go to a balloon festival. And if you're lucky, you might see one of these in the sky, but you can get them uh, made into the shape of minions, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, cars, um, there's hundreds of different shaped hot air balloons out there. Um, and then the thing that we are increasingly going to see is of course spacecraft. Um, maybe not like this one, um, maybe ones that look more like um, aeroplanes, but one day um, we will potentially see rockets taking off from the UK. So really, um, in aviation is about everything that flies. The only thing we don't cover is things that have feathers. So that's typically the term we use is we cover everything um, without feathers. Um, there's also a sister organisation called the Military Aviation Authority that typically looks after military aircraft. So as the video said, we look after everything from the pilots, uh, the cabin crew, uh, how airports are run, making sure airports are accessible um, to people with disabilities and making sure that people aren't um, stuck on holiday. Um, so we do a whole raft of different jobs and it our kind of remit kind of demonstrates the breadth of the aviation and the aerospace sector. Um, if you wondered how big it was, um, this is a map uh, of a typical day over Europe uh, that shows a number of aircraft that are in the air at any one time. And often it's said that there's generally about a million people who are up in the air across the globe in the sky at any one time flying. So they are very, very busy skies. And I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. So talk about more about the careers in aviation. As hopefully you've seen, there's so many different um, things that can fly in our skies and they do so many different jobs that there's a raft of different careers that are available. So there's jobs at the airport, there's jobs um, on the aircraft itself, there's jobs in factories manufacturing aircraft, um, there's jobs for people who are helping people on the ground loading the planes. Um, and I'd like to talk in a bit more detail about some of those jobs and tell you a bit more about them. Um, reflecting on this picture, one of the most important jobs is that of what we call the air traffic controller. And these are, these are the people who make sure aircraft are in the right place at the right time and that everyone's safe in the skies. So you might find them um, at airports. So the picture at the bottom there you can see is a control tower um, at an airport, but you might find them in other places as well. There's a big centre near Southampton where all the aircraft that are flying over the UK are controlled from. Um, people that are become air traffic controllers have to have some quite specific skills. They have to be very good at decision making. 
They have to have good what we call spatial awareness uh, and be able to visualize where things are in their head so they can plan ahead when they're looking at aircraft on the screen. But most importantly, they have to be very calm and collected under pressure. And they need to be good communicators because they're talking to pilots and others um, about how they're flying their aircraft and they're giving very giving them very specific orders as to what they have to do. Um, so there's actually some very specific tests if you want to become an air traffic controller. You need to be very good at maths, um, but you also need to be able to do um, certain things like visualize patterns and things like that. So you can see some of the tests that um, air traffic controllers will be asked to do. So they'll be asked to see what which of these circles a square will fit into without touching the sides, or they'll be asked to very rapidly estimate um, the number of cubes that are in a certain um, block pattern. Or they might be asked to recognize shapes in different forms. So you can see you've got the net, um, the net um, of a cube, and then they could be asked to, to identify which of these cubes are, are the same as this one. So if, if you're doing some of these activities now in your head and you're finding them quite easy and you think you're getting them right, it might be that an air traffic controller is, is the right um, career choice for you. And, and a lot of it's about certain attributes that you already have but they can be practiced and developed. Um, pilots, obviously another very well-known uh, career path in aviation. Um, again, pilots have to have quite a broad range of different skills. They have to be quite good at English because they're doing a lot of communicating uh, either with air traffic controllers or with the passengers on the aircraft. They have to be have a good presence on the aircraft because they're in charge of it and they might have to deal with tricky situations. Um, have to be good at uh, maths and physics. They have to understand a bit about how the aircraft work because they might have to solve problems. Um, the most important thing about a pilot is, again, they have to be incredibly calm under pressure. And the best example of that is um, this chap, um, Captain Sully or Chesley Burnett, uh, as he's known in America. And this is the man who um, landed, a, he had an aircraft that had two engines that failed um, of the two engines that the aircraft had. And he landed an aircraft on the Hudson River uh, in near New, New York um, and all the way through maintained this very cool, calm presence, practiced his training, um, which pilots have to do a lot of, and managed to land this aircraft and save everyone on board. Um, and subsequently has had a film and written a book, but. I think it's his um, skills a testament to every pilot in the world who have to be able to deal with lots of lots of different emergencies and train for them, retain that knowledge and then execute what they need to do um, if something goes wrong. And this chap is a great testament to that. Um, Another type of job, um, there's lots of things to maintain and fix at an airfield. So there's a lot of engineering tasks. Um, so you might have to fix uh, runway lighting, um, which if you've ever seen a runway at night, you'll know there's a lot of it. Um, you might have to fix things like radars um, and other radio communications equipment and all the what we call infrastructure that supports the airport um, and the planes landing all needs to be maintained um, so that it works incredi incredibly reliably. Uh, we don't want these things to break down. So airfield engineering is a very important field um, because a lot of people rely on the things that they maintain. Um, on the other, up in the sky, there's obviously the aircraft need maintaining as well, and they need to be maintained to an incredibly high level to ensure they're safe. But there's a number of different um, skills and type of um, engineering that are involved in the maintenance of an aircraft. So the first one you have is what we call propulsion. So what makes the aircraft go? And typically that's looking after the engines. And the other, the second is about aerodynamics. So how the wings work and how the shape of the aircraft ensure that it can cut through the air and that it gets enough lift to take off. Um, there's a lot of what we call avionics. And these are the electrical systems on the aircraft that that help it go. So all the screens that you see in an aircraft cockpit um, are all maintained by an avionics engineer. You need people that know a lot about materials, so material scientists who know how um, the materials on the aircraft might respond to certain stresses and strains and how they can make them lighter um, but stronger. And other things like hydraulics. So a lot aircraft rely a lot on hydraulics, the use of liquids to move things. So whether that's the wheels that pop out on landing or the flaps on the wings that move up and down and all rely on hydraulics. 
And then the final one is all about the software or the computer systems that are used on aircraft. They need to be incredibly reliable, uh, incredibly secure. Um, obviously, you don't want a virus on an aircraft. So software or the computers that aircraft use is really, really important. Um, and I shared one of uh, a good example of um, a pilot um, who doing a, a fantastic job. And I wanted to share with you uh, one of my kind of favorite aerospace engineers. And that's a lady called Beatrice Schilling. Um, who, if you've heard of the uh, Spitfire aircraft, which was used in World War II and is often cited as being the reason that the UK um, won that world war and was successful with its allies, um, is down to this lady who actually came up with a, a modification to the Spitfire when they were having trouble with it flying. And she came up with this um, way of changing the Spitfire engine so that the Spitfire could roll over and do loop the loops and go all the way um, underneath. So it was flying upside down um, without the engines failing. And it was this lady who was really responsible uh, for the success of the Spitfire. And if you have a chance, I'd encourage you to look up Beatrice Schilling, uh, an inspiring um, engineer uh, who fought uh, a lot against um, the institutions that she was trying to work within. Um, that weren't really geared up for women um, operating at the time. Now, all that has changed, um, but I think we need to kind of hold on to the, the lessons we learned from people like Beatrice and the, the great things that she did and the struggle that she had. Um, so that's kind of one of my top, top aerospace engineers um, that have ever existed. There's a whole plethora of other airfield jobs. Um, there's firefighters at the, on the airfield, there's uh, meteorologists who predict the weather and tell uh, the control towers if it's going to rain or if the weather's going to be um, bad for aircraft landing. There's people who have to maintain a lot of other equipment. So you can see the baggage carousel there. People need to fix and make sure that all works. People who are in charge of what we call dispatching the aircraft and making sure they leave um, with the right amount of weight on board, with the right fuel on board, um, a really kind of mass heavy um, job that requires a lot of accuracy um, to make sure that aircraft are, are operating as they should do because the um, implications if, if they do their job wrong are quite severe. Um, and then there's a whole load of other jobs about what we call the airspace over the skies of the UK and how and where aircraft fly. Um, you might have seen from the picture earlier that our airspace, so like an invisible motorway of where aircraft can go in the sky is incredibly complicated. Um, and the next slide has a video that just kind of shows you how many flights come in and out um, of the UK and how busy and complex that airspace can be. And we need people who can plan um, what that airspace looks like, can design it for the future and make sure that it runs smoothly. So here's a quick video. Each day, around 6,000 flights operate in UK airspace, which means our skies are among the busiest and most complex in the world. This stunning time-lapse video shows the UK's main air traffic control. It was created by the National Air Traffic Services, which turned the flight paths into a digitalised clip showing the direction of each aircraft over 24 hours, highlighting just how busy it is during an average morning. In just four hours between 5 and 9 a.m., thousands of passenger flights can be seen coming in and out of the UK, including 3,500 alone from London airports. That's a lot of flights, which require a number of holding stacks to help keep things under control and ensure planes land safely. The video shows how planes circle around as they come to land in the busy cities due to the limited space available. The National Air Traffic Services have described the UK's airspace as busy and complex. Each year they manage around 2.2 million movements, peaking at over 8,000 a day. There we go. Um, a maximum of 8,000 aircraft a day. So all the people that we just talked about make that happen and keep people moving. And aviation has a really important role to play in society in connecting people, in moving goods around, 
um, and many other jobs that rely on, on people with those skills. Um, and this is actually a, a tree that shows you some of the jobs that are available in, in aviation, and this will be on our website. But you can see at the bottom there in the roots, there really are a number of other, a number of ways you can enter into the aviation industry. So you don't have to be a graduate. Um, you don't have to have studied at university. Um, you can go through apprenticeship schemes and there are internships. So depending on how far you get with your education, um, there are typically a number of different routes for, for everyone. Um, the only thing that's important is that you have a passion and an inquisitiveness um, for the industry um, and that you're keen to learn in whichever way suits you to learn. Um, and the UK is quite lucky because we have a number of um, different types of companies that support the aviation industry. So it's not like it's not just the airlines like EasyJet or British Airways or Virgin. There's other companies that are producing parts for the aircraft. We have uh, engine manufacturers based in the UK. We have companies producing uh, avionics, the electronics and the electrical equipment for aircraft. And um, we have companies producing satellites in the UK and we have companies that need air traffic controllers and we'll train them. So these are just some of the examples of some of the companies in the UK that support um, the aerospace industry. But there are the UK is quite lucky in that there are quite a few of them and they all have different routes. They all have different apprenticeship schemes um, and requirements for people with, with certain skills and passions. So that kind of covers some of the jobs we have today and what the aviation or the aerospace sector looks like. I'd just like to spend the last five minutes just talking a bit about the future. Um, I mentioned that aviation does quite an important job in moving people and goods around, um, but there is there is a downside uh, to aviation. And some of you will probably be aware of this, that there is uh, an issue with the environment. Aircraft um, use fossil fuels to operate and they produce greenhouse, greenhouse gases as they fly through the air. Um, and that's probably the biggest challenge that aviation faces in the future in that we need to find alternative fuels and alternative ways of aircraft operating uh, in the future. So something called SAF or sustainable aviation fuels is one of the, uh, the key things that we'll need to develop in the future. And that is, um, using fuel that's made from crops. Uh, quite often rapeseed oil is used to produce fuel uh, for aircraft and we already have aircraft that are operating on a mixture of traditional fossil fuel and sustainable aviation fuel um, but we that there's a lot of work to, to develop that further to support the industry. Um, there's also like you get electric cars um, there are beginning to be aircraft with electric engines but again that technology is it's quite immature, it's not very well proven, and it will need a lot of skills in particularly things like physics um, to get that technology to where it needs to be to support the industry. Um, the same with things like solar aircraft. Um, and then there's aircraft that um, kind of combine all those things. So this is the, something called the Airbus Zero E, which uses a combination of different technologies um, to create a more sustainable um, aircraft that can fly and without the, the need for fossil fuels and without creating um, the, the emissions that impact the environment. So this is probably the biggest challenge that aviation faces. And I think there will be a lot of jobs. There's a lot of jobs now. And I think in five or 10 years time, there will be even more jobs focused on solving this problem for, for aviation. Um, the other thing is, and we mentioned drones earlier, we will see that, see that drones are used more and more and they require different skills. Um, so they're different types of aircraft. They do different things. This one's delivering pizza. Um, delivery companies are looking at using them for parcels, um, but they also have other applications. So this one here is being used to inspect power lines um, and they can also do things like take pictures and uh, look at the condition of equipment like um, wind turbines, for example, where drones are used with cameras on them to go and look at wind turbines to make sure they're operating correctly because they can save us a lot of time and money in doing this in a manual way. Um, I just wanted to flag that a lot of people, when they think of drones, they kind of see these kind of what we call quadcopter type designs. Um, but there are drones which look like traditional aircraft or what we call kind of fixed wing aircraft. And this one launches from a catapult and it's used uh, in the African continent to deliver vaccinations to uh, remote communities. So there are 
a load of different drones and we're going to use them more and more and more. So we will need people that can fix them, that can design them, that can fly them. Um, and it's going to be become an even bigger uh, part of our industry in the years to come. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is hypersonic flight. So we, I talked, we talked in the description of this talk about aircraft going faster, and that is one thing that I think will change in the future. So right now, a typical aircraft, if you're going on holiday, will do between five and five and six hundred miles per hour. So about ten times as fast as a car might do uh, on a dual carriageway. Um, but there are companies looking at building hypersonic aircraft, uh, and that means they go faster than the speed of sound which is about 760 miles per hour. And there are, are aircraft being developed that can go 1,100 miles per hour. And that will really shorten journeys uh, and help connect people and move goods around faster. But I think the key challenge with, with this is to do it in a sustainable way. Um, incidentally, we've had hypersonic aircraft for a number of years, um, typically uh, for the military. Uh, they've been operating hypersonic aircraft. A lot of this is about translating that technology uh, for the average consumer um, or the average person to, to use to go on holiday or go to meetings. Um, so this will be something that we'll, we'll see increase over the years to come is, is research and development into hypersonic aircraft that can go faster than the speed of sound. Uh, and finally, um, space. Um, more and more we're seeing companies wanting to go into space. The UK has a desire to begin space launches, um, mainly to launch satellites. So for things like communication, um, moving data around the globe, um, satellites are really good at. And the UK can do that. And they could do it in one of two ways, either a horizontal launch, so like the Virgin Orbit uh, aircraft that you see below uh, on the left with the the rocket tucked under the wing. This was the one where we had a launch attempt, which sadly failed um, earlier this year, late last year, or, or vertical takeoff. Um, and the UK in perhaps 10 to 15 years wants to have a number of what we call spaceports um, in the UK. And that will be a, a combination of vertical and horizontal takeoff. And a lot of the, those are in, in Scotland. But you can see the one down here in Newquay is where the Virgin Orbit aircraft took off. Um, and that really does open up a whole new um, range of careers because spacecraft are very different. It's not just astronauts. People will be needed to fly those spacecraft and it might be remotely. Uh, they'll be needed to fix them. Uh, they'll be needed to um, plan how they operate and work out the best routes that they can take. And we also need people uh, in the UK who can build the satellites that will be going on top of those aircraft to be taken into space. Um, so there, there will be a whole new branch of careers uh, in the UK opened up in the space industry. Um, and that's really as, as far as I can go into the future right now in terms of what we know about. I'm sure there'll be much new, much more new things coming up. Um, so I'll stop my talk there. Um, but I have got a few resources that are included in the spreadsheet in, in the uh, presentation for you to look at. Lots of videos, lots of different websites. There's games uh, to tell you more about the aviation industry. Um, so there really are a load of different resources um, out there for you to use if you want to learn more about careers in aviation. Um, so hope you've enjoyed that talk and happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Stuart. That certainly was very interesting and we have got lots of questions coming in that we will put to you. I'm just going to give a quick shout out to some of the schools who've joined us. There are so many of you and I'm really sorry we can't mention you all. We've got St Stephen's RC Primary 6HG. Uh, 6W from Barnum Primary School, uh, Woodpeckers from Harl Scott Junior School, they're in Shrewsbury. We've even got Jacob who's home educated. Hello Jacob, hello everyone else for joining us and uh, we're sure that you want to hear uh, some answers to the questions that you've put into the chat. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague James. And thank you, Lisa, and thank you for everyone attending the game um, today. And yeah, we've got lots of questions for you, Stuart. Um, <laughs> so the first one is by Olivia, and she says, what do you like best about your job? Um, I think what I like best about my job, and I think being an engineer in general, is um, there's always new things to learn. Um, aviation, um, I haven't been in aviation all of my career. Um, 
it's very very complex and there's lots of people with lots and lots of different skills and i think that's probably my favorite thing is every day i do learn something new um no day's the same um but yes they're just always learning about a new part of aviation that i didn't even know existed or a new system or something new uh, it's probably my favorite part of the job Thanks, Stuart. um i think you've mentioned it already um but sam did ask what specific area do you look after yeah, so I, I look after, um, I um, work in a team where we look after the infrastructure um, on the ground. So these are all the, the things at the airport that keep aircraft in the sky. And my main focus is around uh, the use of radio systems. So that's things like radar, um, the what we call navigation systems that aircraft use so they know where they're going. And of course, the, the radios that aircraft use to talk to pilots. Thank you. Bella has asked, how long does it take to control um, for planes? How long does it take to control the planes? Yeah, so I think maybe like maybe the signals, I think she may oh, be Oh, OK, about. yeah. So, yeah, we, we use this term latency, which which talks about how long um, information takes to get one from one place to the other. So for a, for a signal to get from a remote controller to a drone, um, shouldn't take more than um, maybe 10 milliseconds, which is, uh, what's that, 10 thousandths of a, 10 hundredths of a second. Um, so it should be really, really quick. Um, about the same as maybe um, it takes you to click your fingers. Thanks, sure. Um, just was asking, um, where is the most visited place in Europe? The most visited place? Yeah. Um, so um, London Heathrow is one of the busiest airports. Um, and typically it's not just people coming to London, um, but it's um, a lot of people fly to Heathrow to go on to somewhere else. Um, it's what we call a hub. Um, Paris is another uh, airport that's incredibly busy. Um, and if you go over to uh, the Netherlands, they have a, a very big airport up there. I think it's got four or five runways where, again, a lot of people go to to connect with other flights. Um, so th those are the busiest airports. Most visited place is probably between Paris and London. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Oscar's asked, what is the largest plane? Um, so the largest plane uh, is an aircraft you won't see much. It was called an, an Antonov. Um, which was an aircraft used to transport goods. And I think there's maybe one or two that are still still around, perhaps not flying that often. The, the largest plane that's in general use is probably the aircraft behind me, the Airbus Beluga. Um, but again, doesn't carry passengers. Um, the A380 is the biggest passenger aircraft in the world. And Alfie's asked, what's your favourite plane? My favourite plane is the Beluga. I just think it's fantastic and that it, it shows a kind of, um, a one, the wonderful thing about engineering that they came up with the design for this aircraft just to enable other aircraft to be built. I think that's quite fascinating because it's such a niche requirement. But without it, you know, we wouldn't see um, other aircraft being built as they are today. So, yeah, the, the Airbus Beluga is definitely my favourite. Um, Kia is asking, if you could, what would you change about your job? What would I change about my job? Um, I think I really like getting out and about and visiting different places. Um, I'm quite busy with work and um, if I could change anything, I'd probably like to get out and about a bit more and see different airports and different places. I just don't do it as much as, as I'd like to um, because there's so many things to do. Um, and Lewis has asked, how long have you worked um, there for? So how long have you worked for CAA? So I've been working for the CAA um, since 2015, so it's seven years in December. Thank you. Um, Isabel's asking, how many airplanes are there in the sky right now? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, typically there's this figure of about a million people being in the air. Um, so I guess if you divided that by, let's say, 100 or 150 for the kind of average size of an aircraft, that probably gets you close to the number of aircraft in space in in the air right now. Um, but yeah, it's there's there's busy days and quiet days um, as well. So that's kind of an average that's been used there. Um, Evelyn, what I think you mentioned earlier about um, um, as asked, um, but who or what inspired you to study aviation? 
Um, so I was very lucky as a child. Um, I had a lot of role models around me. So my dad was a communication engineer. Uh, he worked for BT who provide phone lines and, and Wi-Fi. Um, I had an uncle who worked for British Airways. Um, two uncles, in fact, who worked for British Airways. So there was there was lots of engineering influence um, that I had quite easy access to. Um, what I, I was never so my, my passion's always been about communication uh, and and radio, and I hadn't really considered a career in aviation until the job came up at the Civil Aviation Authority. But I guess when you think about it, um, there's going to be a big need for radio and communications in in the aerospace industry because it wouldn't really work if everything was connected by wires and they were training behind the aircraft um so yeah that i guess it's that that love of, of radio and communications that led me to a career in aviation um jason um I think in woodpecker's class wants to know how long a commercial plane such as an airbus a300 takes to build takes to build oh gosh um i'm not really sure i mean i can tell you that i think there's about five or six different factories that are involved in the immediate development of an aircraft, kind of the final construction. Um, I mean, they cost millions and millions of pounds. So my guess would be that if you if you were to order an aircraft tomorrow, let's say you got got your checkbook out and wrote a check for several million pounds to someone like Airbus, um, they would they would probably deliver an aircraft to you in, in a minimum of two years. But maybe if you're willing to pay more, you might get it a bit faster. Um, but yeah, I would be surprised if it's quicker than two years for an aircraft being delivered um, from the point that you asked for it. Um, Otter's class um, is asking, how did you learn everything you know about aerospace? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, a lot a lot of my knowledge is based about around what I studied. Um, so there's a lot of physics concepts uh, in the aerospace domain that when I hear things at work, I can relate them to learning that I did at school and university, particularly with maths and physics. Um, a lot of the I, I do go on training courses. So generally I will will go kind of back to school for a, about three weeks a year. Uh, and kind of top up my knowledge and learn about different things. But the main thing is just um, working with different people at work, being um, in different project teams, um, working with others and kind of learning from them. Um, I think that's kind of been the main thing for me over the seven years, the seven years that I've worked at the CAA. I struggled at first because I wasn't from an aviation background. It took me a while to kind of learn the language. There's a lot of acronyms in aviation. Um, but really, it's from my colleagues and other people that I work with that I think I learn from the most. Thanks, Stuart. Um, another question is, um, what I don't actually know or might know of, um, how long does it take to be a fully trained pilot? Um, I, there's a number of different ways you can become a pilot. So there are flying schools um, where, so a lot of people choose to become a pilot for a hobby before they become what we call commercial. So some people can spend, you know, five, 10 years slowly training to become a pilot and doing it in their spare time. Um, some people choose to pay a company um, to teach them. And I think some of those companies will, will say that they will make you, take you from someone who doesn't know how to be a pilot to a, a qualified pilot in a year, but it's very expensive to do that. But you can do it in that kind of time scale if you kind of dedicate a lot of time to it. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Sharnford Primary CV um, asks, what sort of fuels will be used in future aircraft if fossil fuels are replaced? Um, so I think one of the most promising things for aviation is probably a fuel called hydrogen. Um, I think that was certainly when we think about kind of commercial aircraft with passengers on board. I think that's the most obvious contender um, that we'll use. Um, hydrogen can produce, be produced in a number of different ways. One of the ways you can do it is by using a process called electrolysis, where effectively you apply um, power or electrical currents or water and it produces um, hydrogen as part of that process. Um, and if you do that using power from solar panels or wind turbines, then effectively it becomes a carbon neutral product. So I think um, I think hydrogen is probably the most obvious contender. I think there will be battery powered aircraft that are out there. I think generally there'll be smaller aircraft. 
Um, so I would say a, a mixture of, of um, either sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen's probably the big one, or battery. I mean, the, the problem with sustainable aviation fuel is it, it uses up space on the ground to, to make crops to, to turn into fuel. Um, and that takes away from the space that we have to make crops for people to eat. Um, so that's often one of the problems with um, sustainable aviation fuel or, or biofuel, as we call it. Um, so for me, I think hydrogen is probably going to be the most important one. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Lenny's asking, what is the strangest aircraft you have ever seen? <laughs> strangest aircraft I've ever seen? Um, so there, there is an aircraft. So I showed you a picture of a radar um, earlier. Uh, kind of big dish and there is an aircraft uh, it's called an AWACS AWACS if you want to look it up and it's actually got a radar built on top of it um, so those are quite fascinating I can't claim I've seen one of those in real life in the skies but certainly a lot of pictures and we do a lot of work with aircraft like that so that's probably for me one of the strangest aircraft. Um, time I know is um, on, upon us so um, I'll try and get through a few more questions. Um, Year six Cherry Primary Academy is asking, as part of your job, do you spend time in the air? No, sadly not. And maybe that was the other thing. That'd be the other thing I changed. Um, I don't spend that much time in the air. No. So it's not my role's more about everything on the ground. So the only time that I'm in the air is if I'm traveling for work or if I'm going on holiday. Um, so no, not not a great deal for my work. No. Um, so there's so many more questions. Um, the other question we've had um, is what is the fastest airplane right now in the skies? Fastest airplane right now is definitely going to be a military aircraft. Um, the, there is one that um, I think it can travel over four or five thousand miles per hour. Um, but generally that's a that's a test aircraft that was produced by NASA. Um, so and it and it flies under certain conditions. Uh, and it's not entirely reliable. So the fastest is probably going to be something like a Typhoon, um, which is a military aircraft. It can go hypersonic. Um, I don't know the exact speed that it travels at. I would guess around 2000 miles per hour, but you'd have to look up uh, the Typhoon aircraft to see how fast it flies. Something like that or uh, something called an F-35 Lightning is probably one of the fastest, fastest but all military. Thanks, and lastly, um, Wygate Park is asked, how long would it take to program the plane? How long would it take to program the plane? Um, I mean, all the software uh, on an aircraft, a lot of the time it's it's been in development for years and years and years. So if you were to start from scratch, I would say there's, you know, hun um, thousands of hours, probably you know, over 10 years of work that's gone into developing some of the systems on aircraft. I mean, a lot of the time they're reused um, for more than one aircraft, obviously, when they're producing a lot of them. But yeah, years and years and years of experience and refinement. And a lot of time we see that it still goes on today. So there will be software upgrades like you get for your laptop um, or your iPad. You will get those for aircraft where they've they found little issues and they're still still fixing them. So yeah, many, many years of work to um, to program a plane and get the software right. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you for everyone joining us today. Um, we hope you enjoyed the, the talk with Stuart and actually learned lots about the air aviation um, a civil Air Aviation Authority at what they do and also about um, the different careers you can actually get involved in. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and thank you Stuart and we hope you enjoy the rest of um, British Science Week and have a great afternoon. Thanks very much everyone.